frustrated with life after finding a can of fix a flat and a tire pump. Um, and Tom Savoy is going to start us off talking about American Shad uh, in the Connecticut River. All right, so a little bit different than a lot of the uh, lot of the talks in the symposium and, and uh, <clears throat> some of the general conceptions that people have about these kind of things. And so the, the title here is Ecological Trap. And, and you notice the, the, the uh, connotation would be, well, that doesn't sound like it's such a good thing. You know, we're we're uh, uh, trying to restore off uh, East Coast rivers. Uh, you know, we're trying to enhance populations. And yet I think we have a graphic example here, in this case, of uh, creating an ecological trap by trying to do a quote unquote restoration effort. So there's been uh, activity over in this system. Restoration activities got started in the early 1970s. Um, and so we'll, that's the right foot, there we go. So schematic, uh, we're just over here right now. So this is the Connecticut River. Uh, highlighted the stream. It's not actually um, you know, that wide, but it's the largest river in New England. Uh, there are some 22 main stem dams. <clears throat> We're only going to talk about the lower most two uh, for this talk. And um, one of the important facts in this case was that the, the dam here that everybody else in the world refers to as Tolio but since I have the soapbox right now, we're going to call it Hadley Falls. Because <laughs> on the west side of the river, you have the city of Holyoke, which was created, and that's where the dam went in. And on the right side of the river, you have the, you know, the town of Hadley, and it was called Hadley Falls because there was, in fact, a waterfall there. So there was a historical record, and you can go back and pull the reference, and it said the river fell 60 feet, and it was a majestic sight, and blah, blah, blah. And so you go, well, maybe take that with a little bit of poetic license. You go, was it actually 60 feet in one spot, or was it a cataract? But then you can fall back on the, on the, the naming of the place. It was, in fact, Abbey Falls. So was there ever uh, large numbers of fish throughout the rest of the system? Is one of the things that we need to <coughs> gather a little more closely. Here. So this dam went in in 1794. And another very important fact in this, this river system is that the run maintained itself throughout the lower river. So from 1794, or some authors like to use 1849, that's the date that they choose for construction of the dam, they say, well, you know, so now we're talking about 200 years or 250. But it's still many generations of this fish. And again, the important fact was the run sustained itself uh, what was the magnitude of the run? We're going to talk about those kind of things and, and some of the life history characteristics uh, with that. All right. Another one of my little pet peeves, and again, I'm, I'm uh, in front of the room, so I get to say what I want right now. <laughs> everybody talks about these numbers back in, in this time period, you know, the turn of the century, and everybody likes to have these graphs where the numbers approach, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of fish. Well. That well may be the case, but we at least need to consider some of the uh, uh, other things that are going on. You have to ask yourself, at the turn of the century, were there that many fish biologists who were accurately counting all of these species? Again, this is commercial landings, so you know we always have that underground market type stuff. You know, is a, is a commercial fisherman going to accurately report all their landings? So it is what it is. When the first American Shad and River Herring Management Plan was being worked on by um, Land States Marine Fishery Commission, and they hired a consulting company, and Bill Rich just wrote the first document, and it's probably about three inches thick. You look in there, and he talks about landings, and he says, these high numbers were because they were the aggregate of all of those things. And that, that little fact rapidly got lost, and everybody said, shad, shad, shad. These are all shad. That was the big market fish. That's what's driving it. But we've heard other talks, and, you talk, and when you listen to some of these presentations about river herring, some of those numbers were in the hundreds of thousands. So a key point here is that we're talking about numbers or pounds, and did people get one and translate them into something else, and then what did they use for mean size? So there's a lot of more issues here than simple black and white. 
You know, and it's interesting when you come and the plenary starts talking and they bring out some ecological principles and they say, you know, what about poly shifting baseline? You go, absolute. Graham's a genius. She comes up with some of these things. It's a real fact. Now when we shift to the East Coast and we start talking about some of these type systems or restoration efforts and you go, sure, maybe the numbers were a million in this system or two million in this system. But there's been so many significant changes in the habitat, in the ecology. Okay. Is that a reasonable goal? Pauli's argument because you, know, you need to have the long-term perspective. And as somebody who's been working on this species for a long time, goes, yeah, I've got a little bit of that perspective. I know that when in the 60s and 70s, the way commercial landings were recorded into state systems and then got translated into federal systems, if somebody picked up a phone and said, hey, did you go shad fishing this year? And then depending on, you know, was that a commercial fisherman having a good, bad day or, you know, didn't like the state that day, what was he going to report for landing? So we've gotten all the way to 2020 almost where we go, the fisherman is entering his landings almost on the boat. And we assume that that's highly accurate. And then most of us as biologists keep going, okay, we'll take these numbers and just keep working them backwards because they're always at the same degree of precision. But there's a, there's a large gap there. So a little more, um, more things that we need to consider. Uh, one thing that we do know that's true about this graph, and I think some of the other speakers alluded to it, was the peak in the uh, war years, World War I, World War II, there was the high need for protein. A lot of the states relaxed restrictions. We went from having as many as five rest days a week where no fishing was allowed to when the need for the protein arose and most of the uh, able-bodied fishermen were off doing other things. Uh, they relaxed the restrictions. There was no restrictions. It went all the way down to zero. You could fish seven days a week. And then after the war, we did see a little bit of a population decline because of those high uh, effort levels. Again, these are numbers, um, but effort was, uh, was synonymous with that. Um, we reinstituted rest days. There's been two rest days in effect legally since about the, uh, the mid 1950s. So one thing you can do if you have an, uh, an estimate of exploitation rate is turn the numbers game into the population game. And so I have absolutely no confidence in numbers prior to 1960 as far as landings. So, so, the, so the line at that point sort of reflects the landings. And we know that's nonsensical because you can't exploit 90% of an, of an Elocene stock and have any survival. But the point is you can draw this line anywhere you like that's the precision that we would have at this point. Is why did you make it 10% exploitation? Why did you make it 80%? I know if you exceed 40%, you're impacting the stock. You know, you're gonna start to uh, uh, see a, a decline in numbers, and you will see a, a fairly rapid decline. But part of this graph, and so I think from here forward, we just talk about recent history, uh, given my unhappiness with these early values. And so uh, we fast forward. When the dam was constructed, there was immediately a lawsuit. He said, hey, you know, you're impeding fish passage. And the court said, yes, in fact, that's true. You're going to have to implement fish passage. They put in a fish ladder at the Holyoke yeah. Dam, Hadley ha 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 Falls Dam. Um, and it's been there from, you know, from day one, so it was probably 1795. Unfortunately, never passed a single thing. So we fast forward all the way into a modern decades, and I, I indicated that the restoration effort in the Connecticut River system really ramped up in the 1970s. It was a strong driver that was ranked salmon. And most of the people were trying to restore salmon back into the system, restore or create a one, take your pick. Um, and shad was the, was the tag along species. And so they started to, imp they, they said that you have to have more effective fish passage, given that there was zero up until that point. So in 1955, they actually put in an elevator. And from 55 through 1974, you can see there's pretty low, oh, sorry, wrong button, uh, pretty low numbers of passage. It was a very rudimentary system. Literally, when the fish came to the top of the elevator, they got put into a cart 
and push across the face of the dam. And then as technology improved, uh, and the nice part was they actually were able to design a fish elevator. And they call, it, they call it a pressure lock system because you know it's down at the base of the dam. There's all these differential pressures, and I'm sure it was an engineering marvel that they were able to do this. And and after 1975, they implemented other changes, and so that's when we went from well under 100,000, less than 50,000 per year, to over 100,000 per year. And then with subsequent changes, the numbers have really increased dramatically. Now, for a lot of people in the basin, this is what they use as population numbers. You know, so whatever is lifted over the Holyoke Dam, in this case, it was 721,000 fish. They said, well, we have 721,000 fish in the river system. Completely neglecting the fact that there's 140 kilometers below that, and, and that was the stock that maintained itself for the last 250 years. I've color-coded um, the different stanzas, if you will, and there's actually another change in 2015 where they made additional uh, modifications to it. But the, the colors represent when different technological advances. So after uh, 2005, there was uh, two elevators, uh, significant increases to the system, such that you know we, we continually wanted to pass more fish faster, further up the river to and create the restoration or enhance the river or, or whatever uh, term you like. It. But so now we're going to see why some of those things aren't such a great idea. If it advances. I walk up before. Okay, so the fact that the uh, you saw that the, the, the population trend is somewhat erratic, and that's typical of Copias. The bad news for a restoration effort is you don't see the line the line going systematically increase. It just got this erratic trend. So as biologists and managers, one of the first things we say is, oh, there's too much fish. It's overfished and, and causing all these kind of problems. So these small lines or low lines here on the axis represent different fisheries. Uh, the, there is a recreational fisher in the river. You can see it collects well under 100,000 fish per year. And I was, we were very conservative when we estimated these numbers. We did real census on different years. We extrapolated the numbers. We, we could not afford those to do creels seven days a week. So we went out, expanded the numbers for the total season, and, uh, and, th and that's what the removals will be. We also have this, you know, in, in increasingly in modern times, things are catch and release fisheries. And we say, well, with this species, if they were caught, they're dead. The fact that you threw it back into the river and now you can't account for it anymore doesn't mean that it survived. So we were conservative in that we considered that a loss to the population. The other line you see here is uh, commercial catch, the green one. Um, with, there's an in-river uh, commercial fishery that's been prosecuted since uh, well before we were collecting records. Um, and then the other one, the red, was this coastal intercept fishery. And I used to draw a vertical line over here in 2006 when the fishery was closed, but I got tired of making that point where uh, through the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission, you know, some biologists, some managers were like, this is a huge issue, this is the problem, this is why shad stocks are collapsing and not increasing on the east coast of the United States. It was a pre-spawn intercept fishery. The fish were collected usually just south of their natal river. So it was easy for some biologists to go, well, you know, we're shutting down the fishery. It's not in our state waters, but they're impacting us, so that's what we need to do. And when we were making the argument that there was not enough landings there, we also countered and say, well, this is a, a, um, a pre-spawn fishery. You know, if you close that, we should see an effect immediately. Well, the, the counter came back and said, no, it'll take a generation or two to see an effect. And you go, well, how does that work? If they were harvesting them right before they came in to spawn, <coughs> why would there be any lag? 
Long story short is we closed that fishery, and again, you can see that the population didn't recover for a while. It did come up, but it never came back up to the peaks that, that we were looking for. It's not working. <coughs> Thank you. All right, so what are the negative ecological effects to the species in this river system from our enhancement efforts. And here you can see commercial catch and effort. Uh, the, the, the catch is in, in blue, the uh, effort is in uh, red. And so a minute ago I said, well, a minute ago I said that um, one of the first things we want to blame is fishermen. And so graphic example, catch and effort are dropping off precipitously, how could we attribute the, the lack of recovery to fishing when they were only harvesting 50 to 80,000 in numbers and the run was on average 750,000. So they weren't harvesting a significant portion and it's tailed off to the point now where we have this very modest uh, fishery. All right, another thing that the state's done, and so in our in interest of understanding this population is we've been collecting juvenile American shad since 1978. We have this index of abundance. Uh, thank you. Um, we utilize scales. Uh, now odorless are all the rage, but one of the things that people haven't really talked about when, when we're doing these presentations is that the scale has a mark if the fish had spawned previous. So you have this natural tag that allows you to identify virgins and new fish spawners. That's important because if you accumulate the, the virgin fish as they come back into the river, you can create gear class strength of adults. Showed you a slide of gear class strength of juveniles, and this is just a, a graphic of what it's done over time. Here's, here's just the females, and so these are the accumulations of these year classes on the bottom and in numbers as those fish recruited back 